just so dishonest and it's so damaging to this country for the President of the United States to be so detached from reality. Now some of you write me and well he's a liar. I don't believe that. He's delusional. There's a difference between a calculated lie knowing the truth and living in a delusionary world which is what Joe Biden does. He is not in the real world. Okay, now Clinton and Obama, the two Democratic predecessors, they were in the real world. Donald Trump, sometimes he would go out of the real world because he wanted things to be a certain way. Not an excuse, and I think I'm reporting accurately. But Joe Biden lives in a delusional world by telling people in high crime areas, how do you know? We don't want aggressive policing and arrest the bad guys and put them in jail. No, 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 no. We want restorative justice where they all come in and sit around. Why are you shooting people? Now here's uh, Selma and she's going to help you not shoot people. Um, ah, every police officer listening to me right now, and there are a lot of them, knows what I am saying is true. Domestic dispute, on violence with children, there are, there are plenty of support staff when the police have done their job. In fact, in New York City, they send people to Bellevue, which is the mental health facility, every single day. If somebody's on PCP or, you know, they're acting crazy and they're kicking this, and they book them. They arrest them, but then they go right to Bellevue, to the what they call the psych ward. But there's Joe Biden. You know, when we had community policing, and I know crime was low. That's not. Ask Giuliani, ask Bloomberg. That's not true. It's like the, I created more jobs. You know, you're in a fantasy world. But he believes the fantasy world. And you know people like this. I do. You know, and I'm compassionate to them if they're harmless. You, you know people like this. Who, whatever the reality is, they're not going to grasp it because they live in a different place. Now, one of the reasons that it was hard to even lock in on what President Biden was saying is because he speaks so poorly. It's like every cliche imaginable bulletin. Not a joke. Not a joke. I mean, come on. I'm not being a wise guy now. Anyway, all kidding aside, I say, come on. That's not going to happen in America. Look, no, I'm not being facetious. <laughs> I'm not being facetious. No, I'm serious. No, I mean it. I'm not being facetious. No, I'm serious. Not a joke. Not a joke. And I'm not joking. No, I really mean it. I uh, was on a radio at WABC with Bernie and Sid this morning, and they asked me about this because it just drives everybody nuts. All right? I mean, how many cliches can you wedge into one paragraph? He's the record breaker. There should be an Olympic Games. he get the gold medal. But it's a condition. And I do this, obviously, for a living. All right? I speak to you. From here, it goes through my mouth, and it goes into your ear. It's a condition that he has. Is that he can't formulate thoughts in a precise way. He can't. So he's got to drag all of this. Oh, I'm not joking. Nobody thinks you're joking. You're not funny. All right? Nobody thinks you're being facetious. They're listening to what you're saying. And you're the president, so what you're saying is important. I just had her. I mean, you know, you can say, like, stop it. But he can't. He can't. Because he's inarticulate. And always has been. He has to. When he reads off a paper, right, when he reads, when they write things for him and he reads a teleprompter, he can do it. But when he's just speaking off the top of his head, he can't. He just can't formulate thoughts in a precise manner. That's 
being too hard on him? Maybe. I might be. Um, but there was one thing he said that surprised me, and I absolutely agree with it, and it's a very interesting story. He was talking about the high rate of drug addiction in this country, which is killing hundreds of thousands of people. Roland. Here's the thing. We don't have nearly enough people involved in mental health and drug addiction services, number one. shouldn't be sending people to jail for use. We should be sending them mandatory rehabilitation. Mandatory rehabilitation. Here's the thing. We don't send people who use narcotics to jail. Very, very rarely does that happen. They have to sell narcotics. If they use, they get a ticket in New York City. And now, with the current situation in the Big Apple, nothing happens to them. Well, if you do it in Arkansas, in a small town, it's going to be a bigger beef, but not in the major cities. But what he said is mandatory rehabilitation. Now, I don't even know, again, if he knows what that is. I know what it is because I did a master's degree paper at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University on this. On this mandatory rehabilitation for drug addicts. And it is the only way you're going to get that problem under control. The professor, if you want to call him up and check my work, was Marvin Cal, the old CBS News reporter. Marvin Cal. He was teaching at the Kennedy School when I was there. I went to Singapore, where they have this. Now, it's punitive in Singapore. So if they catch you with any narcotics on the island of Singapore, you go to mandatory rehab 22 months. Okay? You go to a camp. And it's not nice. Now, you can, and this was the subject of my paper, you can take the program and make it humane. And that's what we should do here. So why have mandatory drug rehabilitation? Well, number one, most drug addicts and alcoholics, for that matter, are not going to voluntarily go to rehab. They like getting high. you got to start there. Most will not. Some get so desperate that they do. But it's very, very hard to kick an addiction like that, particularly if it's heroin or opiates. Now, in Singapore, the reason they, and you don't have to be convicted of anything in Singapore. If they find it, you're gone, because there's no rights there. I mean, it's a fascist state. They take the market away. There's no one to buy drugs in Singapore. And they hang drug dealers over a certain weight in public, so you can watch. So the risk-reward for the narcotics industry in Singapore is nothing. All right? So, and so they don't have a problem. The market that people would use, they're in a camp. The dealer's got a rope around their neck. Now, if you drive from Singapore to Malaysia, which I did, we'll go over a big causeway. As soon as you get into Malaysia, there's drug addicts everywhere. Because all the Singaporeans who want to use hard drugs, they go to Malaysia. Because they don't have that there. Now, in the United States, the way you would have to it because the progressives would scream and yell. And I don't even think Biden knows that. Oh, no, drug addicts have a right to be high and blah, 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 blah. you don't have a right to put them in. But how you do it is, if you are caught committing a crime and you have drugs in your bloodstream because everybody gets tested now, then you have a choice. You can go to rehab, mandatory rehab for a certain period of time, judge says the time, or you can go through the system, but the bail is going to be fairly high, so you're going to sit on your butt in prison while you wait for your trial to unfold. you got to get a lawyer. you got to do all that. So that's a choice. And a lot of people will take the rehab because the rehab would be holistic. It wouldn't be like Singapore. you get three squares a day. You'd get a decent place to put your head down. Now, that's the only solution to the drug problem. There is no other solution on this planet. Now, Biden hit it. But do, you, do you know? Do you think he knows it? No. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he studied my paper. Maybe.
Maybe he read my paper on it. I doubt it. But it's possible. It's out there. So anyway, um, I should post that paper on BillOReilly.com. I have it. Um, maybe I'll do that. Um, but you can call Marvin Cal and ask him about me. And he'll tell you that I was an excellent student. Maybe. Okay. So under tremendous pressure from Sean Hannity and myself, a Joe Biden has announced sanctions on Cuba. So if you listen to the Hannity program yesterday, we spent a half an hour, Sean and I, saying, are you going to do anything, President Biden, or not? And then Hannity had his TV show on it as well. So that pressure came through. And so now Biden says, we're going to announce sanctions against Cuban officials. That means... They're going to have a list of people who can't come here or something. I don't know what else we can do to Cuba. We got sanctions now. Trump put them on. They're there. And any sanction the Chinese and the Russians are going to undermine. That's what's going to happen. So, all right. But it was interesting to see Biden react today on that. Uh, let's shift over to uh, Kamala Harris, the vice president. So a new poll, morning consult. Um... Democrat 38, Republican 34, Independent 28, fair poll. Thank you, Morning Consul, for, you know, polling in a fair manner. Very simple question. Do you have a favorable or unfavorable opinion of Vice President Harris? All right. 47% unfavorable. 45 favorable. Wow, she's underwater. So what did she do that got this here? Well, number one, doesn't communicate very well with the folks. You know, they have to laugh and all of that. Not comfortable doing that. Number two, the border is just crazy. She didn't even want to go there. And she's in charge. So she's underwater. Another poll. This is very important. But I couldn't get the uh, political affiliation from Gallup. They wouldn't give it to us. And I don't like that. So 1,381 adults on race relations. Gallup poll, uh, question. Would you say relations between white and black people are very good, somewhat good, somewhat bad, or very bad? Okay, so this is the net on that. Net good, 42%. Again, relations between black and whites in America. Net bad, 57%. 57 bad, 42 good. 20 years ago in America, 2001, net good, 63%, net bad, 35%. Now, in 20 years, America has not changed to become more oppressive to African Americans. In fact, things have gotten better. Far more programs, far more um, opportunities in the job place, social situations. Things have changed for the better. But the number is upside down because of the media. Media, the progressive media, wants you to believe that the United States persecutes, and that's the word, persecutes African Americans, particularly police. Okay, so the progressives and the corporate media have an alliance, and the corporate media picked this up. There is no better example than critical race theory. So I'm going to walk through this because it's very important. You've heard about it because there are some school districts that want to teach six-year-olds that white people are bad. That's what it comes down to. But I want, I want to define it. So this is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Remember that? It used to come to your door, but you can still get it. All right? This is critical race theory. It is a philosophy, and I'm reading this now, that holds the law and legal institutions in the United States are inherently racist insofar as they function to create and maintain social, economic, and political inequalities between whites and non-whites, especially African Americans. So, in other words, our society is rigged against 
against African Americans and other minorities. The legal system, the economic system, the school system, everything. That's what critical race theory is. Now, there are millions of people who believe that. Okay? They do. And they want this to be in the elementary schools, starting at age six. You can imagine if that happens. So all throughout the elementary school, high school, and college, all the student will hear is that white people are oppressing black people in their country. So if you're a minority student, you're angry. If you're a white student, you don't know what to think. What do you think? Am I bad? Am I a bad person? Are my parents bad? Are we, are we oppressing? This is what they want, because this creates confusion and divisiveness. All right? That's what the progressive movement wants, and it's gotten it, because the corporate media embraces critical race theory. We'll take. Just because I do not want critical race theory taught to my children in school does not mean that I'm a racist, damn it. <laughs> it's a, actually, it does. It's just another example of Republicans turning kids into a wedge issue, just like their politically motivated attacks on transgender youth who just want to play sports. Critical race theory will, will help you confront what the problems are, will help you see um, how racism functions uh, in American society, uh, and then you'll be able to participate in the, in the process of dismantling these structures and making sure that we create a more democratic and inclusive society. What this is, is backlash politics, coming precisely at a moment where finally racial justice has become a majoritarian interest on the part of Americans from all races and all classes. So this is a way of pushing back against that without saying that we're for racism. Yes. They can say we're against critical race theory. Well, I'm against critical race theory, Matt, because it's bull. There isn't an organized cabal in this country trying to keep down blacks and minorities. It doesn't exist. Now, the NBC network, uh, the AT&T, CNN network, all the network news, Disney, ABC, they, they all, I'm not going to say they encourage critical race theory. Some do. But they're all afraid to challenge it. Because then they wouldn't be woke then they'd be branded racist. So if you are the CEO of Disney, Bob Iger, you are not going to say that critical race theory is bad, even if you believe it, because you're frightened. So I run my own corporation. I can say what I want to say. But believe me, I'm attacked every day, as you know. Okay? But the corporations who put out the mass market news and analysis they're never going to go up against it, but the folks will. And that will be another nail in the progressive coffin. 